Managing Project Scope is one of the optional units in the SCQF Level 8 Diploma in Project Management. In this video, I'm going to go through the unit guides and explain the context to some of the, the criteria that's within this unit. Let's start by having a look at the unit description. So in the unit description outlines scope as being the scope of a project and people's ability to understand and manage it are vital to its success. Understanding the initial objectives, the implications of changes and variations and being able to communicate them effectively are vital as is the ability to evaluate lessons learned for the benefit of future projects. This unit is at SCQF level 8 and there's 12 credit values for this unit. The unit has four learning outcomes. So the first learning outcome is about being able to determine project scope. So that is essentially being able to produce a plan, project plan for managing scope. Second outcome is being able to comply with the controls of project scope. So that is being able, that is now the project delivery phase where you're actually able to comply with the plan that's been baselined. You've produced evidence for an outcome one. Outcome three is being able to manage changes to project scope. So this outcome is about updating and managing changes in accordance with your change management procedure. This unit has links, strong links to other units and typically this unit would be covered by evidence which focuses on changes. So in the project delivery stage, you might have a change to project schedule, project, it could be project scope, could be changed to resources, finances, whatever other unit you might be working on and you have to make some form of change because there's been a deviation. And so a holistic statement on the deviation and making a recommendation and then putting that recommendation into place in accordance with change management procedures. It's gonna be a holistic outcome that falls into a number of different, different units and that'd be best, best practice for that. But it might be you're not involved in any situation. In that case, you can you can, you know, you can do it whatever way you want. But that's just a bit of an outline. Um, so it's best practice to, to get evidence for that that's holistic. Uh, outcome four is being able to evaluate the scope management methods used and to draw lessons for future benefits. So that's just an evaluation on your contribution towards scope management. So we'll start with outcome one. This is planning. This is producing a scope management plan. So 1.1, specify requirements and acceptance criteria that meet stakeholders' needs. So this is, a, this is simply that you're looking um, at the business case and you're taking forward what the specific acceptance criteria. So what is this? What is success for this project? And that is basically your acceptance criteria. Um, so that's your requirements. Your acceptance criteria is what will the, you know, when you come to handover, what will the project sponsor accept? What will whoever this project's been handed over to, what will they accept? Because if they don't accept it at that point, there has to be a bit of rework, a bit of change to ensure they, they do accept it and it does meet their needs. So you are specifying and documenting in your scope management plan what the acceptance criteria is and what the requirements are. So reflect the time that you're outlining the acceptance criteria to meet stakeholders' needs. What was the acceptance criteria? What was the requirements? Who are the stakeholders? And what did you do to produce the requirements and acceptance criteria? And how do you record and document this? Product evidence could be your scope management plan section with an acceptance criteria. It could be success criteria documented in a business case, success factors and acceptance criteria. Or it could be a communications, ne uh, negotiating with stakeholders, discussing and defining requirements and acceptance criteria. So some form of communications where you're actually engaging with stakeholders or um, whoever this project is going to be handed over to you're working on and to find out what their acceptance criteria is. 1.2 is identifying and communicating benefits and disbenefits to stakeholders. So you're identifying what the benefits and disbenefits of this project are um, regarding stakeholders and be able to sort of communicate and get their input on that. So for this one, reflect the time we've had to identify benefits and disbenefits to stakeholders. What method do you use to identify these benefits or disbenefits? How did you record it? How did you communicate it? And to which stakeholders did you communicate it to? What other areas of the project might disbenefits affect? Product evidence would be an email sending scope management plan, which contains benefits and disbenefits analysis. An email, if we've emailed or communicated directly with stakeholders to outline the benefits and disbenefits, and meeting minutes where benefits and disbenefits are discussed. 1.3 is clarify the way in which the scope will be managed from an analysis of the nature and definability of project objectives. So you've got your acceptance criteria and your your Sort of requirements of the project so you're highly very specific this is what success this this project is 
and that you can then take that to form how are you going to manage scope. Scope management is all about defining the, the boundaries of your project to say this is what the project covers, this is what it doesn't. If it's not clearly defined, what will end up happening is that lots of additional tasks, activities, things will just be thrown into the project. To complete those activities and tasks, it's going to take more time, so your project will go over time and it will also be more expensive, so go over budget and ultimately could result in project failure where the project sponsor says no, the cost outweighs the benefits that we're going to get. And that's where the benefits and disbenefits part come in, comes into this. If the um, if the if the costs outweigh the benefits of the project, it's going to be cancelled. It's not worth putting the money into uh, creating this project and, and delivering it. Um, if it's if it's just become this bloated, basically the result project failure. So that's why it's important to manage scope. And so this is why this is how you're defining scope and how you're going to manage scope. So reflect the time where you're managing scope. How did you plan to manage your scope? What was the process for agreeing and baselining scope? And what did you do? in the scope planning phase. Product evidence for this would be a scope management plan, section on control management and planning on how to avoid scope creep. Scope creep is where, like I said, all these, that's the term that's used when, when um, additional tasks and activities are added to a project, the scope gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so scope slowly creeps larger, ends up with project failure. 1.4, baseline and document the project scope. So baseline comes up a lot in project management, Essentially what that means is it is the final planning document during the planning phase. So if you look at your if you look at the project life cycle in terms of planning phase, project delivery phase, during the planning phase you put together a plan of how the project's going to be run. And at the end of that stage you're going to baseline and that is going to be the official plan for your project. However, when it comes to the project delivery phase, that's the next step, the plan is always changed and adapted. You're always monitoring your progress when it comes to a project and that might result in additional things coming up that you didn't expect and that will require tweaks to the original baseline plan. A baseline plan is the final plan in the project planning stage eh, where it's sort of signed over it. This is the official plan. But that's not to say that it doesn't get changed in the project delivery phase. So, for this one, just reflect on how you baseline the project scope. How did you produce the the, the, the scope plan? And basically, the scope plan will involve um, a work breakdown structure. It will involve an organisational breakdown structure. And it will involve combining them into a responsibility assignment matrix together. It may also include a product breakdown structure and a cost breakdown structure. So your breakdown structures typically are, are, are the main components of your scope management plan. But again, it may be different from organisation to organisation and from project to project. So it depends on what your projects do. And how does that help to baseline scope? Product evidence for this would be your scope management plan, give you your work breakdown structure, organisational breakdown structure, product breakdown structure, cost breakdown structure, your RAM or your RACI, which is where your work breakdown structure and organisational breakdown structure are combined together. Uh, or it could also be communication on the green, discussing and uh, pricing the above graphs. 1.5 is then evaluating the importance of defining the boundaries of project scope. This is more of a reflection. It is evaluates a sort of question, isn't it? Evaluate. However, I would not treat this as you would a typical question. Make sure when you're covering this point, it is part of a holistic statement. So when you're writing a statement on scope, ensure you're reflecting within that. And if you reflect within a holistic statement that outlines what you contributed towards planning project scope, then that this will cover this this point. It shouldn't really be a separate question. If you've missed out on it, then it can be covered in a isolated piece of evidence, in which case you're reflecting on a project you've worked on. But it shouldn't be some sort of evaluate importance, at very theory based. It should be very, very, very specific to your particular project. What worked well, what didn't work well. Why is it important that scope was, was defined? What would happen if it wasn't defined? So performance tasks should be an evaluation of our findings and the importance of defining scope creep for your particular project. What would be the impact to the project if scope wasn't clearly defined and how did managing scope help your project become successful? Important evidence for this could be some sort of audit, review or reflective account on what's occurred. So moving on now to outcome two. Out, the first outcome in outcome two, 2.1, is apply configuration management requirement management techniques. So configuration management is essentially a definition of it would be as a table, fundamentally as a table which lists and details the precise specifications of each component 
which is involved in your project. So imagine that you are your project is some sort of manufacturing process. Configuration management would outline every piece of equipment that's used, the specific sizes and dimensions of them, um, any sort of screws, nuts, bolts, all these different individual components. It defines what they are, outlines what the, what the suppliers are, where you can get it from, but it basically defines these are each component. So if something else happens, um, if there's some sort of shortage, you know exactly the, the pieces that were used. At the, after the handover stage, if there's some sort of issue with the um, completed product, then you know what components are into it so you can find replacement parts. And also, if it's a big project with lots of different people working on it, you don't want someone working on one part of what you're manufacturing using um, materials that are of a certain standard and then someone else's, you know, another team's working on another part and they're using different side screws and, and bolts and all these, and then you're trying to join it together, it, it won't work. So it's important that the project management team, even if it's a large project that you're working on, that all these components are, are the same. So that, that's essentially configuration management. So you want to explain how you're applying these configuration management and requirements management techniques. So for like the time where you had to apply configuration management, how did you plan the procedures? How did you create a reference system? How did you manage change requests? And how did you provide reports on this? Product evidence would be your configuration management plan, configuration management document, requirements management document, an email discussing changes or updates or action that you have taken when you're applying your configuration management techniques. It would also be configuration control, the customer client requirements, Moscow, so that's must, could, should, it couldn't or won't, so that's Moscow, and that can be part of your requirements management. So requirements management techniques is working out what is required, what is actually required, what is the what output is required, and then from that you can then work out what are the components. 2.2 is carry out a configuration audit that's appropriate to a project, so that is ensuring that the documentation is all correct, it's fully up to date, there's the right number of quantities, um, if it keeps track of locations, inventory, um, what teams are using it, whatever else it keeps track of, that the documentation's all up to date, that the processes for managing changes and putting in requests are correct, and also that the correct items are being used. So reflect the time where you're involved in a configuration audit, how were you involved in the configuration audit, what were your responsibilities, and what did the configuration audit identify? Product evidence would be a report or document that you have contributed towards carrying out configuration audit, an audit and version control, or some sort of configuration. So the actual audit documents itself would be product evidence. 2.3 is ensure that a configuration management information is suitable for those maintaining project outputs after closure. As I've already mentioned, one of the uses of a configuration management information is that after handover, particularly if it's something where you're, you're in construction, manufacturing, where you're producing a physical good, some machinery, some equipment, then it's important that uh, people who are using it after the handover phase have got access to this information should they need to make any repairs or replacements on uh, the, the output what you've produced for your project. So reflect that time when you're managing configuration management information. What was information? What's the process set out in the project management plan, information management plan? What did you do to manage the information? And how does this allow the configuration management information to be used usefully by end users? So this is about ensuring that the process that you're doing, you gather the right information so it's useful for those after the handover stage. Did you do anything in particular to ensure that information would be useful to that end user? And reflect on why it's important for the end user to have access to configuration management information. Product evidence uh, for this, to support this would be your document containing your configuration management information, which is formatted for the end user, guidance and updated on configuration management. Um, and you don't have to create, but merely contribute. So you might not necessarily be the person who is creating this, but if you contribute to it, then that's enough to cover the point. 2.4, ensure that a baseline configuration management plan is suitable for a project. So this is now at the end of the, the sort of planning stage. So again, these out, these outcomes for this particular outcome seem to be a bit jumbled up here. This might not necessarily be the order that you might want to complete it in, um, particularly if you're doing a sort of chronological order where you're, of when you're actually completing these tasks. Because this one is at the end of the planning stage. So baselining your configuration management plan is all about, during the planning stage, you're putting together your configuration management uh, plan your baseline saying this is ready to go and you can then move into the past that milestone and move into the project delivery phase. So reflect the time where you are working on a scope management plan. How did you contribute to baselining the configuration management plan? What information was contained 
in this information management plan or configuration management plan and when was this completed by, how is the plan presented, how is it all documented. Broad evidence would be the plan, it's baseline plan itself uh, or a review of configuration aspects of the project plan. So that's the specific configuration aspects that are within your overall project plan. So let's move on now to the third outcome, which is about change controls. This outcome is very, very good to do as part of a holistic statement, particularly one that ties into different units. Um, so that'll be specific to do what your change is on. So if your change is on schedule, then if you do a holistic statement, you go into the context, the background of it, that is also going to fall into outcomes within your schedule management unit, if that's one of the units which you're doing. So let's have a look at this one. 3.1, identify changes to project scope from an analysis of monitoring information and stakeholder requests. So this is quite simply that you are monitoring any requests from stakeholders, so anyone who's involved in the project for a change. So other people who are working on the project might identify a change, particularly operational teams who are completing activities as part of the project, they might identify something's went wrong, we need to make a change, this isn't working, this isn't right. It could also be engineers or technicians, people with specific technical knowledge. They might come back and say, actually this technically, for technical reasons, doesn't work, so we need to make a change. So you are identifying, monitoring um, any requests for that and you're identifying them quickly early on. So performance tasks reflect the time you had to make changes to a project management or you're identifying these changes um, and you want to identify how the requests come in, what's the process for these requests coming in, what did you do once you got the request, how did you respond to it. Product evidence would be um, the actual request itself, whether it's come in by an email or the document that it's come in by and also any documents you might need to update to record that the change request has been in or any communications you've had to set out, send out to start off the change management process. 3.2 is recognise and assess the implications of changes to projects. So you're then looking at that change request that's been sent to you, you've identified it, and you're then looking at what impact is that change going to have on other aspects of the project. So we follow on with an example that's a change request regarding schedule. We want to extend the schedule. You'd want to first of all look at the network diagram look at the critical path and see what knock-on effect is that going to have on the overall project. Extend the time means that people will have to work on it for longer and that might, that might include an overtime bill for extra hours, so that's going to have a cost requirement. You might also need to look at resources, maybe they're using certain machines or tools um, and, and they're going to have to be used for even longer on that particular activity and so that might have a knock-on effect on the resources. Perhaps there's, that requires further change to other activities, uh, not just the activity that's initially impacted by this change request. And then that could have a further effect on quality. Um, if you're extending something, you're maybe shortening or you're removing resources from another area, that will have an impact on the quality of what's been produced in that other activity. So there's all these um, knock-on effects from a change request. It's never just the case where change request only impacts one aspect of the project. So reflect on a time where you've had to make changes to a project, what the changes and have some form of analysis of what impact that's going to have to other areas within a project, of what further change revisions might have to be, be made uh, to other aspects of the project management plan. Product evidence would be document including email which you are evaluating, assessing the impact of changes in one area of the project to others. Could be a reporting, monitoring, scope, or any sort of documentation around looking in. You know, if you're talking about changes to network diagram, maybe have the network diagram in there. If you're then looking at what effect it's going to have in resource, have some documentation on your resource there that's shown, look, this is what I've identified. Maybe you're communicating out to colleagues to get their input on it, then you've got a screenshot of the email or the message that you've sent out to your colleagues. All useful product evidence. 3.3 is apply change control techniques as specified by the change control process. So this is you now following the change control process that's specific to your pro program and organisation. Normally it involves some form of change control committee which would regularly meet and will review the change control requests and will then either approve, deny or they can choose to review them at a later date. Um, so they can they can say, well, not quite yet, we're not going to make a decision on this but in the next meeting or we'll give it another couple of weeks or however long and we'll review, review it then. So reflect the time you've had to make a change to pro the project uh, plan. What were the changes? What's your change control process? Outline what your change control process is. Have a bit of knowledge in there and then explain how you then complied with it and what you did to initiate that change control process and how did you record the changes? So there'll be some documentation that you'd have to update and record when you're doing that. 
product evidence would be your change control process itself, ties in with the knowledge, uh, the change control request, uh, the process communication you're sending out, meeting die invites, um, version control as well if you're having to update documents and communication around um, arranging that. 3.4 would be ensure that relevant stakeholders are informed of changes. There's a criteria in the communications unit which is very similar to this as well, so there's a bit of overlap with that particular unit um, as well, that particular criteria in that unit. Basically, if there is some change to the project, it is important that all relevant stakeholders are informed of that change. So anyone who's working on that activity, anyone who's working on if you know if it's uh, needing additional resources, you'll need to inform finance the extra funding required or extra funding's been allocated to that activity. You'd have to explain to people who are actually going to be conducting the activity that they have got extra days to, to work on that activity. Um, if equipment is moved about, you have to um, deal with the resource owners for that equipment. So ensure that all these relevant stakeholders impacted by change are kept up to date. If they don't know, then they will make um, decisions based on their knowledge, which is now out of date, and that can cause a lot of problems for the project. So it is important that they are kept up to date. So reflecting the time you had to make changes to the scope management plan, what changes did you make? What is the procedure for communicating changes to stakeholders? How did you communicate the changes to stakeholders and which stakeholders did you communicate this update to? Product evidence for this would be screenshots sending out up the updated plan to the relevant stakeholders and perhaps an extract of your procedure from the project management plan for sending out updated documents to stakeholders. It could also be maybe version control as well to show that the documents have been updated. 3.5 is amend documents to reflect changes to a project. So this is you actually updating, you know, changes have been approved, it's communicated out, and the documents are up to date. Now I'd probably say that most holistic statements. 3.4 and 3.5 would be kind of switched around. You'd probably do 3.5 before you do 3.4. You'd probably update the documents before you communicate it out to stakeholders. But 3.5, you want to evidence, which is evidence or gather evidence that you have actually updated project documents. You've updated, you know, keep on with this example about schedule. You've updated the schedule plan, and um, you've updated the resource plan, updated the finance plan, that sort of thing. You've changed the version control saved in the right place or if it's done on one your on your software it's been saved correctly and it's then been communicated out appropriately to, to stakeholders. So reflect the time you've had to make changes to scope your scope management plan or to your project management plan. What changes do you make? What documents did you change and how did you log the do the changes or the version control? How did you update, save the document and where do you save the document? How do you archive the old version? So just a bit of detail about how you actually did that. Product evidence would be Maybe screenshots of your version control um, or screenshots of your archiving your old version, saving a new version. Maybe it's in SharePoint and you have to um, you know, flag it, uh, mark it's been archived and put the new version there. 3.6 Explain the significance and treatment of change requests. Explain um, means that this criteria comes across a bit as a question. Best practice is not to have it as a separate question. You want to try and tie this into your holistic statement where you're dealing with a change control, a change control request. If you've missed out on it, it can be done as a sort of individual piece of work, but in which case it shouldn't still shouldn't be treated as a question because it shouldn't be theoretical. It should be really, really tied in with your workplace examples of what you've actually done as part of your project. But again, best case now, tie this in to your holistic statement. Your holistic statement should be talking about a change control request you received, get into all the context of it and go through what you did to follow your change control process, update your documents, communicate it out. And while you're doing that, reflect on the significance of the treatment of change request, reflect on what would happen on the end of that statement, have some reflection, what would happen if you didn't follow that change control process properly. Different teams are making different changes to projects all over the place and in the end that can cause an absolute mess. When it comes to organising your project, so that's that's significant. But you also want to tie it to your specific project and use really strong examples of why it's important that change control requests are adhered to. The process is adhered to in a very specific way. So reflect your experience dealing with change control requests. What impact did the changes have on the project? What was done well? What could have been improved? What are the risks of not following the correct change control processes? And an explanation of your findings and procedures. Product evidence for this would be an updated project document in response to a change. It doesn't necessarily have to be a document from scope management. Um, it could be a document from schedule management, whatever your changes um, are impacting, basically. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't have to be a scope management plan you're updating. It could be a management plan for any aspect of your project. So we're now moving on to outcome four, which is 
reflecting and evaluating on your contribution and your experience working around scope. So 4.1 is evaluate alternative methods to those used within the project for determining project scope, configuration management, change control appraisal, planning schedules and monitoring activities, which includes a choice of metrics. So for each of these, you want to reflect on your experience in managing project scope specific to these things. So configuration management, reflect on your experience on working towards configuration management, reflect on your experience and change control appraisal, reflect on your experience planning schedules and reflect on the methods that you use to do each of these things. In terms of gathering your evidence and structuring this, it can be done as a standalone piece of evidence. Best practice though would be have it contained within other holistic statements and it can be broken up. So each of these um, parts of this list here, project scope, configuration management, change control appraisal, planning schedules, monitoring activities, these are all individual parts and they can be in different statements, but you need to cover each of the points in this list to close off the criteria as a whole, but it could be in different different statements. So you might have a statement that is on configuration management and it, as part of that statement you are evaluating the methods that you used in configuration management. You t you, that, that holistic statement would tick the box for that point on the list. You might have another statement which is about your change control and within that holistic statement you're evaluating your methods that you use for change control and then that would come in and tick that list but not until you you'd got a, a evidence ticked for each of these list items could you close off that criteria but it's just to say it doesn't have to be all done in the one statement it can actually be each of the list points can be split across different statements so performance tasks for each of these reflect on your experience managing project scope or the individual point that's been asked in the list and for each of the listed areas what were the techniques that you use in your project what which work which what worked well what could have worked better and what would you have done differently and is there any other techniques which you could have used um, but you, you didn't and what are they and how might they have impacted what you've done product evidence so this is largely going to be a reflective account but you could also include review documents or communication so thanks for listening and i hope that helps when it comes to gathering evidence and, and understanding the scope management units part of the project management SVQ.